Would you say humor is sophisticated and comedy is juvenile? I, I wouldn't. Uh, is humor sophisticated and comedy juvenile? Um, I, I, I'm not sure that I would use, I would, I would put those in those boxes. I think when we talk about humor, we're basically talking about written prose. Um, Robert Benchley, um, uh, who, you know, Sandra Singh Lowe, who else is, you know, writing comic pieces. Um, so in, in that way, because it's, it's, it's verbal, uh, it's, li it's literally literary. You, it's the writing. Um, I'm not sure I would say sophisticated, uh, but it, it, it's, it follows different rules and it, it follows different dictates. I think comedy, comedy is designed to be spoken and performed by human beings. And I think that's, that's, the, big, that's the big difference, is that comedy is, is, is actor-centric. Um, in, uh, in drama, the dramatic uh, writer is trying to make a point, um, and uh, he's, he's got a theme that he's trying to develop. Uh, and, and even though there are characters in the drama, the important thing is that uh, his, uh, his speeches uh, reflect uh, the, the writer's point of view. Um, and it's, it's a, a, a literary. Uh, centric, it's it's writer centric, um, but comedy as as first performed thirty five hundred years ago by the Greeks is an actor centric art. It's made to be performed by by people who acknowledge that there's an, an imaginary event happening, but also acknowledge that there. Being, being seen performing an imaginary event. Back in the Greek theater, Greek theater, Greek drama, and Greek comedy, Greek tra tragedy and Greek comedy were structured exactly the same. Um, they both had the uh, parados, the entrance of the 50-man chorus. They both had the episodes where scenes were interspersed with choral odes. They all had the exodus. But comedy, Greek comedy, had something called the Anabasis, in which the 50-man chorus came forward and talked directly to the audience. They broke the fourth wall. They said, hey, hey, you, that's a pretty dress you're wearing, whatever, you know. And, and then they would go back as though it never happened and continue on to the audience. There's, there's lots of Greek and Roman dramas in which the characters in the drama acknowledge the audience, acknowledge that somebody's watching them do this. So it's very actor-centric, whereas Hamlet might have a soliloquy, right? To be or not to be, but he's not saying, so what do you think? You, you think I should be or you think I should not be? Because if he did that, it would be a comedy. The act of breaking the fourth wall, the act of owning what you're doing, owning the imaginary uh, uh, events is, is a, uh, hallmark of, of comic performance. I mean, there's a reason why so why one person can get up and tell jokes for two hours, and that's completely accepted. Stand-up comedy. How many instances where somebody gets up and just tells us their life you know, in a dramatic way for two hours? I mean, there are some solo plays, but not as not as ubiquitous. It's group as, therapy. Yeah. As as yeah <laughs> as uh, yeah. I've seen those. I've seen those off Broadway plays. The woe is me story. My <laughs> uncle touched me. Yeah. Um, so so it's so so humor is written. It's literary, but comedy is meant to be performed. It's not it's really not meant to be read. I mean, you could read it. You have to read it. You've written it. Somebody reads it and says, "I want to produce it because I think this should be." Uh, a, um, a play, or, or it should be a movie, or it should be a TV series, or even if they don't, they'll say, 
This is really funny. You should work on our movie or our TV series, or, or you should help work in this theater because you, you know this, this thing that you wrote, which is meant to be performed, spoken, lived through, th lived through comic characters, comic actors. Um, it's, uh, it's a actor-centric art. And so in that way, it can be both glorious but also it can be also ridiculous. It can be, um, what, was the, what was the term you used? Oh. Um, you, you called uh, humor sophisticated and- Oh, versus juvenile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it could be juvenile or it could be revealing. I mean, there's, there's a wonderful moment um, in, uh, in Faulty Towers when you know, John Cleese is playing Basil Faulty. He's the world's worst hotel guy, you know, hotelier, uh, and he's, everything's going wrong for him. And he just kind of looks off to the side and says, says, what was that? That was your life. That was your life, mate. Do I get another? No. I mean, there's just this moment of introspection that we don't expect from our juvenile comic characters. And yet it's totally in place in a comedy. Whereas you can watch, you know, um, I can watch a, uh, a drama and, and enjoy it totally, thoroughly, but never have, never have a comedic moment. Whereas I can't think of a good contemporary comedy that doesn't have moments of, uh, moments of tragedy, moments of loss. How does surprise factor into comedy? Hey! Okay, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Oh, wow. I don't know. Um, because because the, you're playing with people's expectations. So you can either surprise them or you can fulfill their expectations. Both work. Both work. You know, uh, a joke is based upon the surprise ending, you know, the, the punchline. Um, uh, waiter, waiter, there's a fly in my soup. Uh, what is the fly? You know, uh, what, what is the fly doing? Uh, uh, what is that fly doing in my soup? I think it's the backstroke. You know, you're not expecting. The, uh, I think it's the backstroke because what is the conventional thing the guy should say? The the guy should say, um, "Well, I'm sorry about that. We'll give you a new soup. We certainly won't charge you." So when the guy says, he literally looks at the fly and he goes, well, "I think that's the backstroke. That's a surprise, surprising yet inevitable." But also, there's the sense that if you don't have any idea what's going to happen, that doesn't work for comedy either. You have to have some idea of what's going on. The audience has to have some idea of what's going on to be able to enjoy the predicament the characters are in. We'll go back to that, the story about uh, um, everybody loves Raymond and he sees his brother's girlfriend, who the brother thinks is the one, eating a fly. So if we don't see her eat the fly, and then he's just stuck, you know, he's frozen for four minutes, and then he turns and says, she's not the one, how is that funny? So it's not just surprise, it's also expectation. And you're playing with the audience expectation, you're, uh, you're, having them think one thing's going to happen, then you, then you do this, the other thing, or you, you're, you, you pull them into the dilemma of the character and you wonder what's going to happen and you're delighted as you see the character try and fail to solve the problem. Or, or like in The 40-Year-Old Virgin when Steve Carell, uh, it's discovered at his job, that he's a virgin. Uh, we, we know that his co-workers are going to definitely not let it go. It's going to become something. Actually, that's a surprise because he, okay. uh, he, he, they find out at a poker game, he goes home, he stays up all night, he worries, he says, ah, oh, then he tries to talk himself into, it's gonna be fine. He goes to work and at first, this guy ignores it. Oh, maybe I'm cool. And then this guy just says hi and he goes, <laughs> Maybe, maybe I've dodged a bullet. And then he sees Romney Malco 
standing in front of a, uh, a bank of televisions showing a porn going, we're going to get you laid this weekend. And then he realizes, oh my God. So, so it's one, two, three. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's not okay. So that's, um, that's part of, of the expectation. We, we're all waiting for it. And I guess, oh, I guess it's not going to happen. Oh, then it does happen.